Hi, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, our X Reality Academy meetup event. Today, our speaker is uh, Christopher Round, and uh, his topic he uh, his topic is benchmark of VR AR components setup of a VR AR measurement lab and tech technical comparison of headsets and tracking. A little bit about Christopher Round. Uh, with more than 20 years of industry experience, Christoph Romp is one of the pioneers in the field of profession systems and application of virtual reality and uh, augmented reality. After starting his career at Porsche, he joined the um, uh, Frostfor industry uh, uh, for manufacturing and engineer automation IPA in uh, uh, 1999. And then um, he got a PhD degree and uh, released um, a, a thesis on uh, conception and industrial implementation of virtual reality as a digital factory building block. So yeah, so thank you, Christopher. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to take, a, take over the stage, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dominic. So it's a pleasure for me. To, to talk here and uh, thanks a lot for invitation. That's really a honor. And yeah, what, what I want to, to show to you today and to demonstrate is this um, benchmarking of VAI, VAR components. And uh, what, what really motivated us and uh, to talk here to you and to, 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 to show what we did in the recent two years is uh, that, that we have a lot of homebrew homebrewed uh, equipment here that we developed ourselves and the testing measurement uh, procedures we developed ourselves. And all what we did here, it's, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's really stuff that can be more or less relatively easy, easily done. And uh, so this is also part of, let's say our vision that uh, maybe we can, can uh, uh, motivate also other labs, other people, other enthusiastics uh, about VAR. To, uh, to do the same and uh, also get into some technical equipment and uh, develop tests and, and uh, do really um, hardware software tests of uh, reality augmented reality components and to publish uh, the, the testing results to the outside world to, to make uh, systems a little bit more comparable and also maybe to, to motivate uh, the industry that's uh, manufacturing uh, VAR devices uh, to do a good job and to improve further on their products and their services and so on. So that's really what motivated us and uh, what uh, uh, um, made us uh, building up all what, what we are going to see now. And I guess many of you maybe have already seen, um, yeah, for example, YouTubers or so that uh, uh, they get new equipment, for example, a new VR headset, and uh, they say, okay, it makes good impression and image quality seems to be quite nice to me, uh, which is a quite uh, subjective evaluation, of course. And some of them, okay, of course, put their smartphones into the headsets to, to uh, say and transport a little bit about the image quality that uh, such headsets produce. And uh, we wanted to get a step further and really make a uh, comparable uh, measurement so that you can really uh, take a, a set of headsets and, and uh, perform the same testing procedures and, and be able to have some kind of objective evaluation and objective comparison, comparison of uh, such technical devices. And yeah, we, we tested out a lot of stuff and uh, that's what we are going to see uh, now and today. Uh, but uh, we are, of course, also thinking about some, some further developments and uh, where we are going to uh, in the future. Are there other aspects that we wanted to investigate, other systems that we want to benchmark, of course. And uh, that's what uh, we will, will be focusing on at uh, the end of this speech and end of this presentation. So my plan is uh, to talk today about uh, the testing of via headset static image quality then about uh, dynamic image quality, about uh, field of view comparisons, about headsets uh, weight distribution and comparison of this, 
about uh, virtual reality tracking systems, uh, uh, in particular about range, working range, precision, and latency, about augmented reality tracking range and precision. Then uh, we, we got some initial works about uh, collaborative uh, distributed VAR solutions and their resilience of distributed uh, networks. So are they, are they sensitive towards uh, network disturbances, so low bandwidth, latency, or loss of packages, and so on? And that's, of course, I mean, we all know that uh, collaborative distributed VAR is, is a huge topic now and will be even a, a bigger topic in the future, of course. And uh, for us, it was, of course, interesting to see, okay, uh, what are the demands concerning uh, network, uh, network properties, uh, network capabilities, and uh, we also did some tests on that. Then we did some work on uh, coatings uh, of uh, AR uh, projections. So what we did, uh, in fact, uh, was uh, to use um, 3D prints and to code, with, with, uh, code them with uh, projection paint. And uh, the question in this case, of course, you want to have uh, uh, optimum coating, optimum paint on it. Uh, concerning what? Of course, you want to have perfect white and perfect black, but both at the same time, it's not feasible. But uh, what is the best compromise between those two? We tested on that. And then in the end, we will have, like I already said, the uh, future outlook on recent and, and uh, ongoing activities of EDC. So I would then say, Perhaps let's, uh, I always uh, will show some slides in which I explain uh, the, the setup of the testing equipment that we have here about the systems that, that we were using both in terms of hardware and software. And afterwards we will have a little look on, on the practical equipment that we will have here in our laboratory. You can already see we got two cameras here. One is the camera I'm speaking to directly here in front of my laptop computer and the other camera over there, that's uh, the camera that uh, was in our lab where we are able to zoom in and so on and have a look, uh, a dedicated look on particular pieces of equipment. And so I suggest, uh, Vitor, maybe we can start with uh, the presentation slides and uh, I will show just a few slides and then we will go directly into the topic and we will do this for each of the topics that are just mentioned uh, when presenting the agenda. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is an overview. Um, so we had a look on the VR headsets about following properties, image sharpness, white and black luminance, readability of writing, image contrast, and color range. We had a look on VR headsets concerning the field of use, stereoscopic range, influence of different face covers. That makes a difference. Definitely, then refresh rate of VR headsets, uh, weight distribution and torque. Then uh, we are looking on uh, virtual reality tracking systems, precision latency work range, and the ghosting of VR headsets. Then augmented reality market tracking, not already object tracking. We have some recent work, but that's really what I'm going to show in, at the end. Uh, so market tracking we were working on concerning precision, latency, work range, and light sensitivity, collaborative XR, and uh, projection mapping, uh, augmented reality, uh, optimum coatings. Okay. So this is the first uh, test setup uh, that, that we created. So it's about uh, the virtual reality headset static image quality. So about uh, the effects that are just, uh, or the, the properties that I just explained to you and what we used for to do so. Um, we, we have a, a 3D printer here in our lab. And so we uh, printed out uh, some normed, normalized uh, human heads with uh, inlets uh, to put in different camera systems. And uh, in this case, it's a high resolution USB camera that uh, we put in to this headset uh, with a, a 12K uh, pixel resolution and with a, a 20 megapixel lens. And uh, we use the monitor calibration hardware. I mean, this is equipment that's on the market. You can simply buy and uh, use and usually 
it's it's uh, thought to be a, to be a, a used for monitors, but you can also use it for virtual reality headsets. Uh, we got this monitor calibration hardware, the Spider E Light that you can see here in the top middle. We used a web VR environment to bring the content of the screen into the VR headset. And uh, we use some standard testing software environments, the uh, EMA Test Master, the virtual de desktop we used. Um, we used uh, standardized test images like this ISO image and visual uh, sample chart, uh, this uh, Snellen index. And so this is mainly the testing equipment that we used for it. And uh, then I suggest, uh, Vitor, maybe let's have a look onto the camera, how it's looking like here in our lab. And so this is, for example, the head that we have here. Great. And the camera is in here, so you can fix it here to put the camera in back again. And then, of course, you put on virtual reality headset and then you can make the measurements that you want to do and the second device this is this uh, monitor calibration hardware the spider elite that needs to be put just in the uh, optimum viewing angle into a virtual reality headset and then you can use um, then you can use uh, this uh, standard testing software and uh, let the test cycles be run through. And uh, that's all you need uh, to do the tests that we did. And uh, perhaps let's look, uh, uh, let's look at the results of our test. Okay. So here, for example, the results that uh, we gained in uh, terms of the image sharpness, uh, where we got a number of, of different headsets that you can see uh, here, and uh, we, we put them in the order uh, um, from the number one, which was in this case, uh, the Vario VR2, and uh, the last one, which is in this case, uh, Pico Neo, at this case. Next slide, please. So this is about image contrast and yeah we we got uh, now here the measurements uh, that are done in uh, pixel per inch and the uh, ratio one Vito, you got something to add yeah so the difference between the lcds and the oleds that was something yeah, obviously remarkable at this stage. Okay, next one, please. So the white laminates uh, we could measure, but simply an output of the testing software of the test benchmark. Next one, it's the black laminates we can see here. And the next one, the color range, this is this one. And uh, the color accuracy, it's this one. Um, I will not get too much into detail about the test results. Why? Because, I mean, there are much more um, um, output graphs and, and numbers and so on. And you can download all this uh, from, from our website. It's, it's all free. It, uh, it's uh, a service that, that we give to the public to, to give more transparency uh, to the VR AR market. And so all the results are freely downloadable from our website. And there are much more results than what I'm going to show here. And the, what the focus of my talk is today about how, how the setup of this testing center looks like. So, okay, let's have a look on the next slide, please. Okay, this is about the uh, dynamic image quality. And there were mainly two things that uh, were interesting to us. It was on one hand side, um, uh, the uh, frames per second. Uh, is it really what uh, the manufacturers promise that it's got? And uh, of course, ghosting effects. It's the second issue that we want to investigate. Uh, we had two different uh, setups uh, to test for this. Setup one is uh, once again, a 3D printed head with a photoresistor. And we tested a lot of photoresistors, photodiodes to find out which one is the best to, to cover all the different display types. 
uh, that do exist. Uh, we have a comparator a circuit that we developed here, simple oscilloscope and a pulse generator or pulse counter. And so what you can see just behind me here, that's already the setup that we have here. And maybe Vitor can, can give a focus with the camera on the setup here, which is setup number one. Yeah. So this is the head with uh, simply a photoresistor on it. And then you can have a look here on the oscilloscope. Yeah, so here you can simply see, okay, what is the frequency now, of course, of the light sources here that we have here in our room. Uh, of course, the use case The use case is, of course, to put the headset on it here and then to measure it inside here. And um, so to do so, or because uh, the headsets, of course, uh, the, the brightness of the image shown, it's uh, different, of course, depending on the headset, on the scene that you're looking at. So you can a little bit adapt the sensitivity of, of the semiconductor here with, with, with the circuit that's simply done here. And then you can read out the frequency of the headset over there. Okay. So let's have a look on the setup number two for the ghosting. Once again, we use a 3D printed head. We now use a high frequency USB camera with the properties as mentioned. And uh, there's also software available for ghosting tests, usually for monitors, but we also use them now here in the case for the headset. Uh, we have this broadcaster software and uh, Kinovea software, and that's usually something we use for ghosting testing and the head should be this one. Let's see the three printed head. So this is the one that we are using for this. So once again, 3D printed head, but with another camera inlet and another camera to be used here. And let's have a look on the results. On the left-hand side, we see a comparison of the manufacturer statements on the frames per second and uh, compared to what we measured. And uh, those measurements have been quite, uh, those, yeah, the values have been quite precise. So we, we did not find uh, any surprises concerning the frame rate. Uh, it was more or less always what the manufacturers really said what we could measure here, so no bigger deviations. And also what uh, was quite nice, what we found out that ghosting is really not a topic anymore. So we could hardly see any ghosting. So really a very good positive testing result. Okay, let's have a look onto the next issue that we were looking at, yeah. Field of view tests for virtual reality headsets. And how did we do this? Once again, it's with a printed head. This time we used two cameras. Um, we used a transparent half sphere, which is also here in the lab. I will show you in a minute. Um, we got some software for camera calibration. And uh, then we simply measured out really the, the image that was taken by the camera. And why we use this uh, hemisphere here this hemisphere we used to put in the cameras first to calibrate the cameras to really say, okay, this is zero degrees, this is 90, 45 degrees, this is 90 degrees and so on. So we have here all the angles written. And so we take a picture with the camera and then we can say, okay, this is the image uh, of the camera and we know exactly where the certain degrees are. And afterwards, we uh, take uh, photos with these cameras inside a virtual reality scene. So we put on a headset, take photos in a VR scene, and then we make an overlay with the photo we just 
took before within this hemisphere and then we know exactly okay this is only 160 degrees maybe or this is 120 degrees and so on we can directly compare the image taken within this hemisphere with the image taken in the virtual reality world and then we can see okay how much is really the field of view and not on the field of view of uh, one camera we can also of course we want to have the field of view for the two cameras we got two eyes of course we want to find out also what is the stereoscopic range so how many uh, degrees uh, uh, in stereo vision that's also something we can find out with these cameras so this is um, other kind of camera that we have here it's, it's wide angle cameras so we had uh, high resolution we got high frequency and this is now wide angle to wide angle cameras that are really able to take more than 180 degrees okay and uh, let's also have a look on the results that we obtained here Yeah, so you can see here, okay, the manufacturer statement, uh, our measurement in black and then in, in white, uh, it's a deviation. And uh, so here the, the testing results are not uh, as positive as they've been for the frame rate. Here we see sometimes um, uh, really remarkable deviations uh, from what the manufacturer said to compare to the measurements that we made. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, the binocular diagonal field of view degrees with the original padding. Next, please, for the different headsets. This is a horizontal field of view. The monocular right eye vertical field of view in degrees here on different headsets okay this is a stereoscopic area with uh, the original padding also measured in degrees and uh, also here uh, and here we have uh, the influence of the face covers and of course if you've got a, a huge face cover this will increase the distance of the uh, vr headset display uh, in with relation to your eyes and uh, this will of course uh, lower the field of view because you're far away from from the display simply and uh, so petting has an influence definitely and this is what uh, we uh, had a look on here also i mean the idea was to, to find out in some cases why we uh, found deviations between the manufacturer statements and our measurements why is it so did they measure with other paddings or without any paddings and then came so to a huge field of view could be the reason for it uh, so it's it's always um, i mean th that was one of our conclusions that it's always of course important to, to uh, state exactly to say exactly what padding is uh, used to when doing these kind of measurements okay and so yeah, once again, uh, analysis of the influence of face covers for the monocular uh, right vertical field of view, the diagonal stereoscopic area and the vertical stereoscopic area. Okay. So that was field of view analysis. And uh, this uh, brings us to the end of the optical properties of virtual reality headsets. What uh, we then had a look at was uh, about uh, the weight distribution and the torque uh, that is uh, uh, generated by virtual reality headsets. And usually uh, what you find in, in, uh, in the manuals or in the description of, of your headsets, it's, it's only the absolute weight of a headset. But that's, of course, at least from, from uh, my opinion, that's it's not sufficient. Uh, uh, we also need to know, of course, where this weight is located. And of course, it's a difference if the weight is somewhere here, if the weight is here, or if the weight is distributed around your head, for example. And uh, having, for example, the same weight, this can make a huge difference in the torque that is generated onto the neck. And uh, therefore, the idea was here simply to take four scales, as can be seen here to have a cross 
lying on this uh, four scales and uh, to have a virtual reality headset on this head of styrofoam and then simply measure, measure the weight. And then it's simple mechanics. You, you can, of course, calculate the torque that, uh, that's coming out here. Yeah, let's have a look on how it's looking like. So this is, uh, this is this cross that I mentioned with a styrofoam head and uh, your four rubbers uh, that are lying on the scales. And so this is then how it's looking like for scales. And you simply read the weight values of these four scales and then mechanics. And uh, then you got the, the talks. Okay. So, and this is uh, one of the outcomes here. And uh, what you can see um, in black, it's, it's the weight. But uh, as I said, it's, it's not one-to-one uh, -one correlation of weight to talk and uh, some manufacturers are much more clever than others in distributing the weight around the head. For example, put the, the batteries uh, to the rear side of the head and so have a better, uh, simply a better weight distribution. So that you can see here, for example, yeah, if we have a look at the uh, Microsoft HoloLens where you got the batteries, at the rear side of the head. And that's obvious, then you get a very low torque, even if uh, you have a remarkable weight. And then another representation is here, it's uh, uh, simply uh, visualizing the center of gravity of the VR headsets. And uh, I mean, the, the center of the head is, is somewhere here. And then you see uh, the far away, the center of gravity is of course the largest the torque. And this is, of course, also a point that uh, we want to, to give to the manufacturers to, to really optimize this point, because it really makes a huge difference, not only concerning, I mean, the torque uh, on the neck and to, to minimize this, but also, of course, if the center of gravity is really central to the head, it's, uh, you have a simply lower uh, momentum. So you, you, you need less energy to turn the head, for example. And uh, that's, of course, uh, something which is quite nice for ergonomics. And so really an issue to, to think about when designing new virtual reality headsets. And I mean, the, the testing equipment that we build up here, it's, it's really primitive. I mean, it's, it's simply for scales and uh, some, some mechanics and that's it. And then you can really have these uh, nice uh, measurement outcomes. Okay, let's get to the next topic, which is about virtual reality tracking. And here in particular, tracking range and precision. And for this, we use the robot that you can see here, this U Factory X arm. It's a five axis robot, which is more precise than a millimeter. And so it's enough for, for most tracking systems really to, um, to give a position. And you can be sure that's relatively this position with a precision better than a millimeter. And then of course, the virtual reality tracking uh, system should come to the same uh, conclusion uh, where for example, the uh, VR controller is actually. And uh, this is simply what we did. Um, with this uh, three printed human head, once again, we put on the VR headset and either we fix it on the ceiling or we fix it on the table. Why did we fix it on the ceiling? Because like this, the robot can move freely underneath this uh, VR headset. And uh, we have once again printed in um, fixations for, for the controllers here. And uh, we used a software and a modified open VR version. And uh, we used just yes, this robot uh, platform software, uh, some Python programming and uh, some uh, self-developed uh, HMD tools. So it, it's a development from us. And what we mainly did, um, we uh, drove some, some circle with the robot and uh, in, in some layers in, uh, in the, the same altitude. 
And then uh, on the other side, okay, it's, it's perfect circles here. And of course, what we want to get also from the VR tracking system that it shows to us perfect circles, because that's really what we, uh, what we were acting with the robot. And so I think the next slide is already some of the results that you, oh, this was about working range. Yeah. And I mean, uh, here we got, of course, uh, much fewer systems than for the optical properties because many virtual reality systems are using the same tracking systems. So there were not as much via tracking systems to test as via headsets to test for optical properties. So this is results on working range that we received. Then average deviation in a certain position. Mm -hmm. And this is so um, comparison of these uh, ideal circles that we uh, uh, gave with the robot and uh, the virtual reality measurements that were done at the same time. And of course, what we can see uh, working range uh, in some tracking systems really got an issue and in tracking behind the user, for example, or uh, they have a really an issue with precision that we can see here, the Vive Cosmos, it's, it's really not very good. And the Pico Neo 2 is, is very good in the circumstances. So a big difference that uh, big differences that uh, we could find here. And that was about virtual reality tracking. I mean, we can have a look at the robot probably and uh, show it with a camera how it's looking like. We have it in static or you wanna let it run? What do you think, Peter? Okay, so this is how this robot is looking like. Mm -hmm. So I can also show to you some of the uh, controller fixations. So this is also equipment that we printed out. So you can see here, and this can be fixed to the robot over here. And then you simply put in the VR controller, such as oh, this one also. Once again, simple 3D print. And it's also fixed here to the robot. Okay, great, wonderful. So let's get back to the slides. That was uh, uh, testings about uh, virtual reality tracking, and we got lots of lots of uh, uh, testing results. Uh, and uh, like I said, they can be all found in the report, but we will not focus really on the results here, but about how we built up this testing equipment. Um, next issue that we wanted to 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 know more more precise on was about augmented reality tracking range and precision. And uh, for this, we also used uh, the robot for the dynamic test. But uh, we also used, all the first step was to do a static test. And uh, yeah, okay, the static test um, where we designed uh, this, uh, uh, this construction here out of, uh, of these uh, methods here that we can see here. And uh, some, some equipment, well, how does it work? Uh, simply, you, you put in your, uh, your tablet PC over here, and here on this side here, you got an augmented reality marker, and you direct the tablet PC towards this marker that it's really looking with the camera central onto the marker. 
And then of course, you know, uh, the X and Y axis must be zero. And the Z axis must be the distance between the marker and the tablet PC. And this you can simply measure with a distometer, which is this red device that we got here, this Leica Disto X 310. And we did this uh, for uh, different light conditions. So we have a lux meter here, which is fixed here just a, uh, above this uh, um, uh, augmented reality marker here. And this is uh, the screen. It's a screenshot from the tablet PC. So you can see here a red cross and this red cross need to be uh, centered really onto the marker. Therefore we have these uh, black markings here. You center it and uh, as I said, then you know X and Y axis are zero and the Z axis is the distance from the tablet PC to the marker and this you measure out with a distometer. And uh, well, we have some kind of, it's a little software environment that you can read out the uh, values from ARKit, ARCore or Vuforia uh, from a distant computer, which is connected uh, to the tablet PC. And uh, then you can make the comparisons. And to, to check out uh, also under mobile conditions, we fix the tablet PC also to our robot, like seen here. And uh, here you see the entire setup. So here's the augmented reality marker. Here's uh, the tablet PC fixed to the robot and the robot moves and uh, then we get uh, different values and we can compare uh, the, the robot output or the robot control where the robot says, okay, it is actually. And on the other hand, what the augmented reality library says, uh, where the tablet PC uh, is positioned actually. Um, yeah, I would say, let's uh, shortly have a look onto the setup. So here's the tablet PC. And yeah, with the camera on it. And so the camera looks onto the marker here and uh, need to be centered directly here towards this marker. And here we got this distometer. And distometer is so here in the center. Here we can read uh, uh, light conditions. And uh, then we can now from a, from a distant computer read out what uh, the augmented reality library on this tablet computer is saying where this marker is actually what it measures. And we can directly compare it to what we read here and what we, uh, what we know from the axis X and Y, which is zero. So let's have, a, let's have a look on the results that we got here. Yeah, oh, it's just a really a, a, so, a short excerpt of the results. And to what we see, for example, here on the left-hand side, that's already the robot moving. And uh, this is a position in millimeters. I think it's uh, the Z axis that we have here. Um, and here you got uh, the coordinate dynamics with Vuforia AR kit, AR core over the time that we see here. And here you can see, simply see that AR core has, has an issue over here where it becomes very imprecise, for example. Next, please. Okay. It's a tracking range, um, five measurements at all and uh, we see uh, Vuforia works until uh, three meters uh, with a 10 times 10 centimeter AR marker. Uh, AR kit works until close to two meters and AR core until yeah, 60, 70 centimeters. And yeah, that's okay. In the end, I mean, what we got as a result from these manage, uh, from these measurements, it's a comparison of uh, these libraries. So we just had a look on uh, ARKit, ARCore, and Vuforia, 
and we're looking at uh, working range speed at the static precision and the dynamic precision, so on the movement conditions. And uh, these are more or less the results that we got here. It's lots of lots of graphs that we uh, generated. And uh, yeah, th this is the overall, overall judgment that we would make uh, over these three libraries concerning market tracking. So this is simply what uh, all we are talking about here, it's market tracking capabilities. Okay. The next, what we wanted to, to think about was uh, network resilience of distributed collaborative virtual reality solutions. As I said, it's a huge topic, of course, uh, working together in distributed environments. It's uh, fantastic capabilities that we have here nowadays. And, but the question is, of course, what you do with uh, bad network conditions, latency, bandwidth, uh, loss, of, loss of packages and so on. And so we have a nice setup here where we are using, yeah, I mean, the, the first step that, that we are taking is uh, to, to find out what are really critical situations for, for networked environments. Of course, it's, it's not keyframe animation. I mean, if you've got a keyframe animation, you simply send one order and uh, this uh, animation is done on each connected computer and it doesn't need much bandwidth or anything. So um, keyframe animation is it's, it's not interesting to the measurements. I mean, what's really interesting, interesting it's, it's dynamic content, which is rather uh, speech. So if someone speaks and uh, you want to have this talk on other computers, or if you've got uh, moving avatars. So if one of the uh, users is moving, is navigating, and uh, you want to have uh, this to be visualized on remote computers. And uh, then it becomes interesting. And that was the first to find out. And of course, this scenario of a user moving, we want to have, have it in, in some kind of normalized um, uh, representation. And also, therefore, we once again use our robot uh, to, to make a uniform uh, uh, scenario, uh, the talk and wave scenario. That's how we how we called it. If you have a look on, on this uh, picture at the bottom center here, it's a talk and wave scenario. So that's it's really uh, the kind of interaction that is critical to distributed VR. And so we had a setup here. Uh, where we looked within a, with a camera into a VR headset. We also have inside, yeah, it's simply an LED, an LED which, a, which is switched on in that moment where a command is given to the robot. And well, the robot itself and the robot control has some latency also. And of course, uh, what we wanted to, to, to um, take out of our calculation is exactly this um, latency that is uh, produced uh, only by the robot itself. It's not interesting to the measurement, so we have uh, to, to, to get it away. And therefore, we have this control, LED as control. And then we know exactly when we give a command to, to the uh, talk and wave scenario. And uh, yeah, that's simply what we took with the LED and I mean the LED is mirrored with on the on the display of the VR headset and this is filmed via this camera what you can see inside here and so we, we uh, emulated a number of scenarios we use this uh, network emulator that you can see here I can show it to you here so it's this device over here you can attach uh, four clients to it and then you can emulate any network conditions. If it's uh, Wi-Fi, it's a it's, uh, uh, hard cable network, it's a mobile connection, whatever. And uh, you can set the parameters, the distance and bandwidth and so on. And then you, or you can set certain disturbance scenarios and see what's coming out. So we had first tests doing this, uh, which were quite interesting. And we are, I would say, in, still in the ch stage where we, okay, we know now what are the interesting scenarios that, uh, that are worth to be investigated and are worth to, to, to put efforts in. And uh, now we have the first results that we can have a look, in, look at, uh, yeah, that we have here and, uh, yeah, we will continue on this. Uh, what 
have we here? Well, we have the packet, packet loss in, in percentage and uh, the data transfer rate uh, over the time with uh, certain scenarios. So what is happening in the scene? And what was also interesting to have a data transfer when increasing the number of uh, users of this uh, collaborative scene, uh, which went to a stable level, apparently when uh, reaching a number of six at all. That's what we see at the bottom left side here. And yeah, uh, we have first ideas and first things that we're doing here, but we, we will continue on this. This was, was one of our last uh, efforts that we are doing in, in this test lab here. Okay. Let's continue. Then, yeah, coatings for augmented reality projection mapping onto 3D, 3D printed objects. And uh, like I said, so our idea was, okay, to, to combine 3D printing with uh, on projection um, to have uh, what we call hybrid prototypes that are both tangible. You can take in your hands and, and touch them and get a look and feel. Uh, of your prototype, but also, of course, you want to have dynamic content on it. Maybe you want to interact with your prototype. You want to show different configurations, or you want to, to have glass or mirroring shadows on it. And of course, you can do this with digital uh, projection onto it. And the, the big question is, of course, what is uh, the perfect color to put onto your uh, 3D print? And uh, what we did here, uh, we, we produced a huge range of different uh, grayscales here that you can see here, and we simply put it, coat it onto the bricks with an airbrush system, and then we put on a pattern of black and white on it that you can see here, and then we calculated, okay, what's average white value, what is the average black value of one of these cubes that we can see here, and in the end, we simply uh, had a calculation on uh, the maximum uh, and minimum contrast and, and of the contrast ratio and of the absolute contrast that we could achieve with a certain grayscale. And uh, what was interesting to see, I mean, the, the basic idea is to say, okay, let's get as dark as possible. And then let's take a projector that uh, has a very high uh, brightness. And then you put as much light onto your uh, physical object as possible. And then even if you've got a quite dark object, it will appear white because you put so much light on it. And uh, so the idea is of getting darker, 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 maximize the contrast of the projector, and then increase the brightness of the projector. But the problem is that uh, most projectors, uh, when you increase the brightness, they do not only increase the brightness of the white value, at a certain stage, they start also to increase the brightness of the black value. And this will uh, minimize your contrast. And uh, the, the critical question is to, to really to find out this point, uh, where's, uh, where's the, 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 this level value, where the projector starts to, to lift up also the black value. And you shouldn't exceed this point. And so this is the maximum contrast and maximum brightness that your projector should take. And uh, then you take the different grayscales and then you take quite dark or the dark value that uh, then produces for you the maximum contrast between the black and the white. And uh, this in the end can give uh, quite nice results. Uh, so here you see this example of a concept car from Mercedes-Benz, this avatar car. We also made some tests on, on for example, a washing machine, which is white, uh, where we have, that's quite nice, also look onto inner structures. As, so behind the glass in the drum, for example, of course, you can virtually look into such a uh, solid 3D print object if you do a digital projection on it. And you can animate the drum and uh, we also put in some some uh, uh, touch sensors so you can also interact with it and yeah i think that will really help people that want to also go this way in, in producing prototypes that are both digital and physical to find uh, the best uh, coatings and the best uh, uh, way to to uh, project onto them okay so i think that's mainly what we did in the recent one and a half, two years. And uh, what, uh, what we want to show to you here 
it's also also a little bit an outlook which it's not only an outlook uh, and uh, but a lot of these uh, activities shown on this slide here we are already um, uh, doing something in these fields of course ar markerless tracking is, is a much more interesting topic than uh, marker tracking uh, or marker uh, based tracking uh, of augmented reality so uh, this is of course an issue and uh, then for us of course was a question how to do this and i can show to you the approach uh, that we were doing on this so mainly the idea is okay we have this uh, 3d model of this electric motor that you can see here it's also 3d printed and then coated into a realistic color and so this can be tracked by augmented reality tracking systems, of course, that are able to do model-based tracking. And of course, we want to know now where in space really is this object located. So we need to uh, have an independent measurement of the absolute position now of this uh, 3D print here. And uh, this is what we are doing with the optical tracking system. So what you see, in our lab now behind me, we have a six camera uh, virtual reality marker, uh, virtual reality tracking system from, from ART. And uh, when we, are, we were doing last year, this uh, comparison of uh, virtual reality tracking, we also compared, so the uh, usual uh, VR headset tracking that is nowadays commercially available at commercial uh, virtual reality headsets. We also compared it to, to this uh, six camera tracking system and uh, we found out that uh, this six camera tracking system has a precision of better than a tenth of a millimeter. So very, very precise. And this is of course perfect to, to make the absolute measurement of this 3D printed object via via the spheres over here and then we can compare the value given by this vr tracking system uh, to the value that uh, the augmented reality tracking systems are giving for this electric motor so this is a testing setup for this and uh, we are doing this actually and now and we can do of course both static measurement but we can also fix this, this electric motor to the robot once again and have a dynamic measurement for example for movement of the robot Okay, let's have a look on another issue. Yeah, projection screens, we didn't already begun. Same with LED panels. Uh, 3D cameras, 180 degrees, 360 degree cameras. Yes, we have a nice report uh, on this out now. And it has a technical comparison mainly of, of the uh, specifications of all the cameras. Uh, we have, a, I think, a nice list of all available camera systems that are on the market right now. And we made a lot of compatibility checks with the viewing apps. So if you want to do uh, virtual reality broadcasting, 100 or 360 degrees uh, streaming, and what does work uh, on the other side in the VR headset, on, or if you've got a, a special, or in particular, cardboard virtual reality on your smartphones, there's a number of apps available or platforms. And uh, that was really something that we were looking on. And uh, the cameras that you see here, yeah, we all got them in our lab here, had a look at them on them, quite interesting. Um, smart glasses, we didn't begin this topic either. Uh, and, uh, I mean, of course, smart glasses uh, to have a test of the optical properties, it's uh, much more complicated than on uh, virtual reality headsets uh, because uh, the, the um, um, the image quality largely depends on what is behind the smart glass because usually they are uh, optical see-through see -through glasses and uh, the um, virtual distance of, of the user's eye to really the display system, uh, it's, it's harder to define than with uh, virtual reality headsets. So that's, uh, uh, I think, quite a challenging issue. I hope uh, we can start working on that in um, 2022. Um, 
but it would also, of course, for us mean to, to have some, some really relevant investments into a, a good number of AR headsets for we can then uh, do this test with. Uh, what we also recently did in contrast was uh, uh, having a look on the uh, heat development of uh, virtual reality headsets. Uh, maybe some of you remember that was, for example, an issue for the Google Glass One that uh, in some uh, occasions became quite hot, very hot. And of course, it's, it's uh, not something that anyone wants because on one hand side, it, it uh, simply burns your ear or burns your head. And of course, it's uh, a lot of wasted energy and energy that it's better invested, of course, to, to have a longer duration of working time of, of your glass and uh, you do not want to produce heat, of course. And so um, we were starting uh, working on uh, heat investigations and I can show you a little bit of the equipment uh, that we were uh, uh, doing this with. And yeah, maybe you can turn the camera. Yeah. So first idea was, okay, we need some kind of uh, cli climate chain chamber uh, where we can define a certain temperature, put the virtual reality headset in and uh, then see if we run it, for example, with a full VR scene, how uh, heat develops within this virtual reality headset. And therefore we took this climate chamber uh, here. It's, it's a commercial one usually uh, used for drinks but it has a nice temperature range, uh, which is uh, in the range of what we need between I think 16 and 22 degrees. And of course, the first issue is if you take a VR headset and uh, you don't move it, it will switch off automatically. And so idea was here, we take a servo platform and then we simply regular move the VR headset here. We put the VR headset onto this 3D printed head once again, we simply move it all the time, put a VR scene in and see with the temperature sensor, how the heat is developing. So is it somewhere in here? No, here's usually the heat sensor. Yeah, you see here, this is uh, what we got in here. It's an Arduino board. So quite simple electronics. Let's have a look here, Arduino board. This is the temperature sensor and the temperature sensor should be at the position should be at the position of the eye and then insulate it from the backwards. And so this was the first idea to do so. But then uh, the next uh, problem that uh, occurred was, of course, if the VR headsets do not see the tracking system, they also switch off automatically. So in the end, it, it will not work like this, like we did it here with this climate chamber, put in a headset, move it all the time. It's, it's simply that the tracking is missing and then it will also switch over automatically. So that means in the end, we will now uh, go the way that we use a, a climatized room that we also have here. And we will simply use this device here now to do a preconditioning in terms of temperature of the virtual reality headsets and then put them into a climatized room and then run a VR scene uh, in the headsets and then measure the temperature at the position of the eyes here. And like I said, this will only be for preconditioning the VR headsets. Then another issue could be also interesting is uh, what we realized here. Let me see if we can, well, it's, it's quite still quite dark. I think we would need some kind, of, I don't know, a light source. We have a thermal camera within this, uh, yeah, had 3D printed it. Yeah, here we can see it. And here it's, let me see, yeah, here you can see it. This thermal camera, which is in here, which is also interesting to see if there are, it's, it's not only so the average temperature that we are able to measure, but it's also uh, to see are there some hotspots, for example, in the uh, headset and hot areas and cold areas. 
And so it's a simple USB device. It's, it's not expensive at all. Here to see connection of the USB. And that's it. Once again, 3D printed head with some easy testing devices here. So I think let's get back to the slides. I think that's it mainly of the activities that we have here. Let me have a look. Yeah, we are through. So that's it. You saw on the one hand side, okay, we, we took a lot of, lot of topics in the recent two years and tried to approach them and to find out what are really critical uh, properties, what are properties that are not critical at all. So we got a, I think, quite good feeling at the moment about what is really worth investigating, what's not worth investigating. And uh, there's a good number of issues that we are still working on and that we are approaching meanwhile. So still a lot of work to do. And uh, yes, I would be happy to keep you informed about uh, what will be the outcomes um, uh, in the next year. Um, I think we have on the last slide uh, still the link of where you can download to the reports. Like I said, it's, it's all freely available. Uh, we can also give it directly to Dominic and she can distribute it to you if you're interested in reading this. So thanks a lot for your attention and uh, feel free to ask any questions if we have so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for Christoph's um, amazing, I, I would say like very detailed and everything is real. Because usually when I saw things, usually it's like pre-recorded videos, right? But um, I cannot believe you are actually in the lab and demonstrate something like actually there and show us the number. So I, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that's the German spirit, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I really love that, um, you know, like all the statistics right now b before when I see all the numbers, I, I just like, okay, so this is probably factory, you know, or marketing numbers. But when I saw like the way you measure it, is really, really scientific. And I really appreciate that the, 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 the science spirit to trying to investigate every single element or functions of each device. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. Very welcome. Yes, I mean, in the end, we wanted to have these hard numbers because I mean, of course, if you have a look on the requirements of, of industry, for example, that they come to us and ask us, okay, we want to, to make certain stuff and, and which kind of headset do we need? And, mm. and of course, it's like that. Okay, I hear some noise. Okay, so, and they ask us uh, what uh, VR headset to take. And uh, of course, for example, color accuracy is a topic. If you got some manufacturer and he's got a certain red or a certain green. And uh, then of course, if you do VR, he, he wants to see exactly this kind of red and this kind of green. So you need a good color accuracy. Or if you think, for example, about uh, driving simulation, the peripheral view is very important. If you're doing driving simulation and you want to have a pedestrian, you want to see a pedestrian coming from the side. So it's, it's, that's really a critical issue. And if you sell a VR headset to someone who is doing so driving simulation and said, okay, I need 185 degrees. And then you take a headset and it's written on it 185 and you buy it and then you see, well, it's, it's only 160. I mean, that's simply not acceptable. And therefore we wanted to have these hard numbers and I would absolutely appreciate, I mean, some manufacturers, they, they gave us a call and, and were interested in the results. Uh, I would really appreciate to, to, to have some impact on the industry producing this headset and uh, of course making clear to them, okay, there are people around the world that are looking on these devices and be, be true, of course, in, in what you uh, give as uh, uh, technical properties of your uh, devices, uh, that everything is correct, just as you write it down in your specifications. Yeah, and so far, as far as you observe, uh, which VR headset is the best? Like, 
I, I think you simply cannot say it. It really depends on the requirements. Oh, some okay. are very good in, in readability. Some are very good in color cohesive. Some have a fantastic field of view. Uh, some are very good in terms of ergonomics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, what would be quite interesting, and that's also an issue we, we did not uh, 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 challenge until now, is to have really uh, good structures, uh, uh, structured um, um, a specification for, for, for the application. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you can say, for example, if you're doing driving simulation, okay, you should take one of these three or four headsets, which are quite good for that mm -hmm. application. If you're doing design applications mm -hmm. and styling, then it's better to take this one. So it, it really largely depends on what you want to do, which headset to take. Uh, how about like consumer ends? For example, like all in one, like, I don't know, like Oculus Quest, um, because I, I actually like personally, I have Quest 1 and I was thinking about buying Quest 2, but you know, since, you know, all the games right now, as far as I know that only Resident Evil um, requires Quest, Quest 2. So that's why I'm still like holding out. But when I saw your data, I was like, wow, as, like they, they are all good or bad, you know, just for two of them comparison, right? Some of them Quest 2 are better. Uh, some of them uh, Quest is better. So um, yeah, so it's a little hard to like, oh, which one is the best value just for a consumer who love playing games or sometimes trying new apps and just for personal entertainment. Um, what types of uh, headset do you think it's good? Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're a private consumer, and uh, you, you uh, do not want to set up, for example, larger tracking elements in your room, in your living room or anywhere else. Of course, Quest 2 is a fantastic device. Definitely from, from the, the, all the, the, the technical specification, it's, it's really mm -hmm. amazing. And for this price, it's really yeah. something you can absolutely recommend for anyone who wants to, to use mm -hmm. VR at home at a low price with a very, very high performance. Absolutely. I mean, of course, the issue is uh, uh, with uh, data protection and so on. Oh, do, you yes. want to, do you want to accept a Facebook account and so on? Or you want to invest some, some hundred dollars more and uh, use it without uh, giving your Facebook, uh, Facebook account to it? But I mean, there's, there's an issue that uh, um, everyone has to, to ask himself and to, to, to give an answer to himself. But I think what's also definitely a point uh, that, that's coming out here. I mean, we all have individual preferences. We have all individual uh, 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 properties that we say, this is important to me and this is not important to me. Some have no problem with a huge weight. Some have no problem mm -hmm. with uh, uh, better resolution or lower resolution. And they said, I want this, I want a fast one or mm -hmm. something like this. And of course, individual preferences are also different, like it is for the yeah. applications. And uh, therefore, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Or is it simply, I think the, the recommendation I could give, of course, as, as I said, I mean, Quest 2 is a fantastic device. There are other very good and fantastic devices on the market. Mm -hmm. And I think it's always a good idea to test it out personally and, and see and, and to check it with your own preferences what is the best headset that you, you want to use. Perhaps also concerning uh, what are the uh, applications that are using on your mm -hmm. headset? I mean, what kind of games are you doing mm -hmm. or what kind of applications are you using? Mm -hmm. And uh, then you say, okay, well, this headset is just better for me and this one is worse for me. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I think ev everything you are doing is just like open my eyes because I didn't, know those numbers are coming from all those uh, laboratory, you know, uh, some, some, something looks like, you know, super smart that I don't know how to use those types of device. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate it. I And I didn't really know that, you know, you, you use like a 3D print and you dig the eyes, eyeball out and put the machine inside. I think this is really smart. Yeah, 
uh, not only you can you know put you know a, a model of a head, but also inside the eyes you want the data and you use those stuff to calculate the lights, the distance. Uh, I think this is amazing, like super smart device. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's cheap and it's not rocket science. Of course, there is measurement equipment on the market, very professional measurement equipment that it's, for example, used by the headset manufacturers themselves. But this measurement equipment, usually it's, it's very, very expensive. And uh, what we found out uh, in some cases, the, the cameras that are used within this professional measurement equipment, they do not really have the capability of uh, getting the data that you want to have. For example, we saw that uh, the, the field of view of the cameras of this professional equipment gets up to 160, 165 degrees. Ooh. And that's simply not enough. We wanted to have 180, 190 degrees as cameras if you want to measure some kind of, uh, mm -hmm. such kind of headsets. Mm -hmm. And that was not available on the market. And like I said, I mean, it's it, in the end, it's what we did is sheep, you print out a normed or normalized head with normalized eye distance, with, which is 60 millimeters or 65 for min. And then you put in the standard cameras that you can get on the market. And I mean, the advantage of this approach of doing so is you can always buy the latest and the best camera technology mm. that is available and they get to the limits. And that sometimes it's harder if you've got a fully configured uh, measurement system where the camera is in and so on. And uh, so our impression was they're not always using the best cameras available. Mm, yeah. And as far as I know that um, today, I just read the news that Apple is going to launch their AR VR um, glass next year. And the price is about a thousand dollars. And I saw the design absolutely apple you know they just wait until the last minute they have to launch they just force launch and then later on they occupy the entire yeah industry and then that one is very interesting and also yeah just like you mentioned that mixed reality right like all the mixed reality stuff is you know like now like quest as far as i know you can do the transparent and you can see the outside of world but as far as i try it's not clear enough right like the contrast yeah because it's from vr to trying to do mr right and also i would say like for example um right now we have extra device for example like the um 360 audios right and also the the scent right you can smell the scent and in AWE, I, I went to another really cool like glove or hands, right? It's like, yeah, I, I know it's all like electronic stimulation. I couldn't feel the difference between I, I touch a cat or I kind of like there's a, a, a water drip pulling. Yeah, so all those stuff, I believe in the future, you probably can come up with a really smart way of, I don't know, measure all those besides the eyes or limited to head. I don't know, it's just some cool, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there. I think there's a lot of, lot of work to do. And uh, I mean, just uh, keeping track with all the new devices that are coming on the market, that's already, mm -hmm. that can occupy oh. entire stuff here, of course, definitely. I mean, we're looking very much forward mm -hmm. uh, uh, for what Apple is publishing next year, hopefully. I mean, we've heard several times that they will come out with some AR smart glasses. And of course, yeah, we know Apple's attitude, they will come out only with something that's perfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, so looking very much forward to it. Wow, yeah, like I'm, I'm very excited. And especially I saw you were measuring like the gravity of it. And I find out that it's very interesting because in VR, right? For example, I, I really don't like to play something related to there are some gravity involved. For example, like walking in the space. I feel so dizzy, right? Because of the uh, motion sickness stuff. So yeah, so yeah, I, I still don't know how, how to solve it without extra uh, uh, accessories such as a chair or, you know, a treadmill or I don't know, hang in the middle of the air or something to simulate that, uh, you know, walking in the space. But I find out that, you know, by, by knowing our body and knowing the metrics, uh, we can definitely design something that according to different purpose, we can have 
you know, personalized experience and make uh, VR experience much better. Just, yeah. And I, I think those data are the foundation of how to make a user feel more comfortable inside VR space. Because right now I know that a lot of people still feel that, oh, VR. And, and personally, I couldn't really, like right now I watch, for example, like v movies in, in VR, right? I couldn't watch more than 30 minutes. It just, first, it's too heavy, right? And second, for some reason, it just, I don't know, my brain just start, um, you know, feel, feel dizzy or something. Yeah, those stuff, I don't know whether the, the machine can measure like, oh, after 30 minutes, uh, normal people or a lot of people, majority of people will feel sick or something. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, it's, it's, it's different, of course, very much individually. I mean, some people hmm. support it quite well and some don't. But that's, of course, that's, uh, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not aware of uh, the actual status of uh, uh, vestibular stimulation. I mean, there have been some, some headsets where you could uh, uh, give stimulus on the vestibular organ to, to minimize a little bit this sea sickness or cyber sickness, motion sickness. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, of course, it, it uh, will remain an issue. I mean, there are a lot of people that are still sensitive to it. And to, to my opinion, also treadmill will not solve this solution because I mean, of course you're moving your legs, but you're not moving forward. You're not accelerating. Yes. And, and, yes. uh, and so uh, this is still missing. Yeah. And uh, either way we come to, I mean, now you can walk around some meters with a VR headset, or we come to this kind of uh, stimulation of, of your vestibular organ where we, we could really solve this issue. But yeah. I mean, if we have a look on, on the investments in the VAR scene, there's still very, very much money getting into new technologies. So it will be amazing to see what will come there to us in the future. I mean, what we already saw in the last 30 years was, was fantastic. And uh, I mean, there have been many different approaches and some of them didn't were developed further on, but sometimes you see them reappear at another uh, edge and uh, they will come up again. And uh, so it's, it's uh, really a, um, a field of technology that it's uh, so interesting because uh, the, the uh, frequency of innovation is so high and in so yeah. many ideas, technologies, innovations coming up. And yeah. uh, for us, I mean, we are doing purely technology transfer of VR AI here. And it's, uh, so we are just all the time looking on what's new and what's happening and what could be successful. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, it's, it's really a cool job that we got here. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's amazing, but it's a lot of work to do. Yeah, especially migrating the entire human beings to metaverse, that's, an incredible amount of work need to be put just by making everyone, you know, having, you know, every household has a VR headset. That's already a big challenge. And getting everyone into that headset and start creating something inside headset or working or doing like, you know, like, uh, you know, something like a website, but, you know, in 3D version, like you can do anything inside that digital space. It's already appealing and especially for the device. We need to create some device that for us to feel like there is no, you know, like um, difficulties or yeah, nothing to make you feel uncomfortable to live in that digital life or digital twins, right? So yeah, I think, yeah, when, when I see you are like, you know, like your company is doing a lot of measurement and those measurements will really help us to understand the machine more and also understand like how can we, um, you know, make a better headset or make a better, you know, uh, adjustment to, you know, reach the next level and make uh, all the users feel comfortable. I think, yeah, the contribution is a phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Also here in, in Europe, uh... Metaverse is, is a very, very big issue, big, big topic, and mm. lots of discussion uh, yeah. about Metaverse, of course, about uh, the big opportunities it will offer, what are the risks, and so on. But uh, I mean, if uh, Facebook is now going to invest uh, two billions, it, it cannot fail. 
And so <laughs> we're absolutely curious about what's coming there. Mm, yeah, I, I would say that um, as far as I know that a lot of big companies, they want to get a pie or, you know, like they want to dive in and, you know, get the metaverse. But um, I also see another part of people, they want like the metaverse decentralized, right? Not belongs to any company, just like ready player one, right? Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so I, we still don't know what metaverse will be, but I think just by working on it, talking on it, creating content on it, we are all part of it and moving this trend or this reality forward, right? So yeah, so thank you so much. And any other questions, Gene? Yes, yes, I have some questions. Uh, fascinating talk, uh, great work. Um, thank you. One of the things that I've been wondering about was I've read a lot of complaints from people about trying to wear glasses with these headsets. And I'm just wondering if that's something that you can perhaps benchmark, as well as the inter interocular distance. Uh, I know I've talked to um, eye doctors before, and they say they see a tremendous range of interocular distance in people. And I know that these headsets. Connection is broken. Hey, Jean, connection. Do you want to? Hello? Oh, we're losing his connection. Do you hear me no. fine? Yes, yes. Now, yes. OK. Uh, so anyways, two things that I've been thinking about was uh, how compatible are these different headsets with glasses? Because if you, re I've heard a lot of complaints about this. And if you remove the population of people that wear glasses from this whole metaverse thing, that's gonna be a lot of people. Also, uh, meta is gonna need a lot of developers and a lot of developers won't develop for something that doesn't work for them. So if those developers need glasses and they don't feel comfortable with the headsets, they're just not gonna develop. Uh, so those are two areas that I think perhaps would be uh, good for benchmarking. Uh, I, I think uh, Meta has sold between 4 million and 10 million headsets so far, depending on whose estimates you believe. And they're going to have to sell a lot more before this becomes a real pervasive thing. Um, uh, and, and what I'm wondering is, you seem to have very much your finger on the pulse of all this stuff. And uh, so what... One question that I would have is, what is the biggest shortcoming that you see right now? And in five years from now, where do you see that this will all go? Will it be like 4K per eye, OLED, 120 Hertz, or what? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's get through the questions. Interocular dis uh, distance, yes, that's definitely an issue. And I mean, we designed heads that have female size, actually 60 millimeters. Um, and uh, we were working with them. And uh, for some of the uh, measurements that were monocular, here it doesn't, did not play a role. For the binocular, of course, it played a role. And yes, we also sometimes hear complaints from people that uh, are not able to adapt a VR headset in an appropriate manner uh, to their individual interocular distance. That's definitely like this. And from a mechanical point of view, which headsets do allow it, Vito, you know it from art? Okay. So Quest 2 has only three different distances that are fixed, okay. You can shift it mechanically for most of the others. And for the VAIO, it's automatically eye distance, uh, uh, it's a uh, ocular distance adjustment, okay. So this is the state of the art that we got now. Uh, perhaps, I mean, 
The, the question is always, uh, do all the users adapt really the VR headset to their individual needs when they are using it? Or do they take some, some settings uh, from, from the pre-user and uh, didn't correct it once again? Usually that should be feasible right now. And uh, uh, I mean, a few years ago, the, the headsets couldn't be adjusted. That's, that's, that's different now. So most of it can be adjusted, motor, most of them freely, one automatic, and the Quest 2 has only three certain positions and you have to choose one of them. Um, for the glasses, yeah, I mean, for, for me, myself, it's not a problem. I take off the glasses um, and still I, I can see quite well. For those who got strong glasses, yeah, uh, headsets are problematic. I mean, what's quite interesting, I mean, a few years ago, we had uh, virtual reality headsets based on an entire different technology on retina projection. So they were projecting directly onto your retina, which worked out even very well for those people, people who have very thick glasses uh, and uh, so, so close to, to be handicapped. And uh, so this was really a promising technology, but nowadays no one uses this anymore. They all use uh, OLED displays and, and other fixed uh, substrate displays is, nowadays. Is the retinal projection just too expensive? I think optical quality was not sufficient. Okay. That, yeah. Uh, the name of it was Avagant. It was a glyph from Avagant. And uh, perhaps uh, one could simply uh, or find someone who continues to produce this kind of technology, but even Avagant themselves, the company themselves had a technology shift and they're using other display technologies nowadays. And I mean, the main issues of further development of VR headsets, I mean, what everyone is already uh, always discussing about is of course, always resolution and field of view. And this is, of course, obvious. It will be the, the next thing that, uh, which will become better and better each year and uh, with each version of the headset. Um, as we found out, ghosting, this is not a topic, topic anymore. So if increasing frequency will help a lot in the future, I'm not sure. Um, weight is, of course, uh, is a topic. Uh, to make uh, your headsets lighter. And of course, what was a very large step forward is uh, that you do not need any external tracking systems anymore, uh, like Lighthouse, for example. If, if you have a look on the uh, Autark via headsets, I mean, some manufacturers have systems out now, like, like the Quest 2, uh, HTC also. And uh, so to have simply a VR headset that's tracking the environment, you don't need a tracking system anymore and you've got your controllers and so on. That's, uh, that's of course, it was a big step forward. And I will also expect the other uh, manufacturers to go this way and to enable full six degree of freedom tracking without any external tracking systems. That's uh, of course something to, to make VR much more easier, much more acceptable. For, for everyone to use it at home. It sounds like we're on the verge of getting what look like regular glasses uh, that have a lot of augmented reality capability. It doesn't seem to be real mainstream yet, but there are little pockets of development that seem to exist. Uh, I would think that that's gonna be a huge growth area. Yeah, and also to my impression, I think that uh, augmented reality will be the, by far bigger market because you can use it as some kind of assistive technology uh, anywhere where you are, always where you are. Uh, you can have AR capabilities incorporated to your glasses. Of course, it needs to be minimized again uh, and to be smaller and so on. But uh, if you think of the, the capabilities uh, and to the situations where you could uh, use augmented reality in. I mean, it's, it's a, a fantastic, amazing world. It's, it's anywhere where you're looking to something, where you have questions to your digital assistant and so on. And uh, that's by far more than using a VR headset, of course, at home. I mean, you, you will use it. It's, it's a standard use case at home or 
uh, our partners here in our network, uh, most of them are companies. They're doing uh, product prototyping or industrial engineering or training of stuff within VR headsets. Of course, it's very useful, but uh, the, 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 the perspective of using augmented reality is much larger. Yeah, yeah. I would think that um, your smartphone display is going to become obsolete. Yeah, I, I just read a news that Apple is going to spend around 10 years to migrate people from, uh, you know, smartphone to uh, glass, but they are going to launch their glass next year anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the big point will be uh, the user interaction. Um, if you do not have any display with touchscreen and so on, the question is how to input data in a, in a very robust and efficient way. And this is uh, if you're having smart glasses new to the people. I mean, of course, of course you can do uh, speech recognition, this, but this might not work in all situations. Uh, I've seen some clever solution where using a small ring like uh, Amazon and North, North Focals head, maybe a combination of this, of uh, speech recognition, of, of having a ring with you and something else. And then, I mean, if this works out, then you need to get people used to this kind of interaction. And this will be the big topic. And I found it really very interesting and surprising fast uh, when the uh, smartphones came up, how fast uh, people get used to using touch screens. Uh, both on, on the smartphones and on the tablet PCs, which was for, for most of the people was a new interface they didn't know before, but it was so intuitive and so smart and so clever from the software that it was really a pleasure to use and uh, user experience was simply great. And uh, I think this will be the crucial question, getting to the next interface, if this kind of interaction will work in a good way that people will accept it. I think um, eye tracking may be part of that solution. Um, uh, and when you think about it, you know, your smartphone, one of the things frustrating about a smartphone is how small the display is. And uh, if you have augmented reality, the display is no longer limited to that small size. In fact, you could turn your head and look in different areas of the display. So it could be a huge display. And Dom, I think, covered something in one of her news segments on and i think facebook is working on this or meta is working on this it's a wristband that detects motion in your fingers and hand and uh maybe that would be part of the solution maybe something that uh, monitors uh the firing of neurons in your hands would be a, a similar type of solution um I, I'm just getting the impression that, you know, if, if, if I say to you, remember back before smartphones, what your life was like, and you, have, you when you think about that, you say, I can't even remember what it was like back then, because we're so used to it now. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to have these glasses, these augmented reality glasses, within some number of not too many years from now, and that type of interface. And after that, you're going to ask someone, oh, remember what it was like before we had this? And they'll say, oh, I can't even imagine what it was like before we had all this. Yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, imagine you're, you're getting on a travel without a smartphone, with no navigation system and so on. I mean, that's a stone age. Yeah. And uh, perhaps we will have the same impression 10, 20 years from now on, if someone is getting out without a smart glass, yeah and would say it's stone age yeah Could and it's be. got your stereo in it and it's it's got your camera in it and uh all kinds of interesting things yeah yeah, yeah. i mean the, the the amount of data that you can fill into such smart glasses i mean it's giant of course and this is uh, i think the real value of it there was um uh, an article recently on um a new device uh that's in prototype stage. It stores about 500 uh, terabytes of information. And it's a little uh, sort of a, like a little cube that would easily fit within the palm of your hand. And they're using uh, basically optical access of a cube of optical media. And 
getting these tremendous storage capabilities. So mm -hmm. I, we have tremendous storage coming. And um, I know we always think that, you know, the next storage evolution is going to be more than what we need, but somehow we always end up using it up. But um, that's coming as well. So there's a lot of technologies converging. And if we manage to survive as a human race, <laughs> we should have some interesting things to look forward to. Yeah, I imagine 5G and 6G, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and recently I read a news, uh, it's in Taiwan, it's in Chinese. Yeah, so basically um, some eye doctors talks about that um, metaverse will destroy a lot of people's eyes, just be, you know, like people overuse the, the screen and the light uh, go through inside your eyes, the frequency or the, the, strength, the strength is too high and it will cause glaucoma, uh, which will damage the optical nerve and uh, causing permanent uh, vision loose. Yeah, so do, do you, because right now when I search VR and glaucoma, like I, I type the keywords, it's usually the, the positive side, right? Because we want people to enter to that world. So I feel like there are a lot of negative side that people don't want to mention it. But when I saw that, I feel like, yeah, like right now you see like a phone, right? Phone is so addictive. If I go out and I forget my phone, I feel like I got lost, right? Uh, yeah. And then you see like I overuse my, my 2D screen and I have a monitor, right? Imagine if, if in the future we are, you know, every minute we are in the headset, then our eye might got damaged easily because you know our body or our revolution, evolution is not um, going as fast as technology. So what do you see? Like, do you, do, do, can, can we, or can you measure, like, I don't know how, how technology damage our eyes? Yeah. Yes, I, I didn't hear about this. I know this discussion from at about 50 years ago, six years ago, when the uh, CRT monitors came to the workplaces. And there in the beginning, they had uh, such a harsh uh, radiation that it really uh, damaged uh, the user's eyes. And then of course, it was then uh, the, one of the consequences was uh, governmental re regulations on the uh, CRT, CRT monitors uh, to, to, uh, to um, have a, a radiation that doesn't uh, really damage uh, the user's health. And we have not seen this kind of uh, checks and regulations on, on any of the VR AR devices until now, as far as I remember. And uh, of course it is hard to do because uh, like I said, there are so many different technologies and they come in such a high frequency that it's, it's hard uh, for, for the government or for the doctors to have a look on it and see, are there any, health issues on, on uh, such uh, devices. And I mean, that was of course in the discussion when uh, people are a little bit uh, reluctant when, when thinking about retina projection, they said, oh, well, there's someone projecting directly on my retina. Oh, this can, couldn't, couldn't this be dangerous? But uh, I mean, it, it wasn't. And of course, uh, usually uh, medical doctors know what you can do with the retina and what is dangerous and what isn't dangerous. So um, interesting to hear from me. That's new for me to hear. And uh, I mean, we can also at VDC have an eye on it. And, uh, but definitely there are uh, hospitals and eye doctors that are really specialized on this. They are specialized on, on the effects of, of display systems on the human eye coming from this history of, of uh, 50, 60 years ago. And uh, where it was really serious damages to, to many people. The main thing that I've read about with in this vein is that um, when you have LCD displays, you have a, a, a backlight of some sort. And um, quite often those backlights are white LEDs. And a white LED is actually a blue LED with green and red phosphors added to it to create the white color. And uh, those phosphors wear out over time. And so you, instead of a white LED, you end up with more of a bluish LED. And I know you can like buy glasses on Amazon that try to cut down on that bluish tint 
And that's often uh, described as something that uh, promotes fatigue and so forth. And maybe there is some uh, wear and tear on your eye due to that. I'm not sure, but um, of course, yeah. if you've got an OLED display, it, it gets rid of those types of problems. Yeah, there are investigations on, uh, on the effects of uh, different uh, light colors on your biorhythm and, and on your health. And uh, of course, it's known meanwhile that, for example, blue light in the evening rather makes you awake and uh, gives problems uh, with your sleep afterwards. So uh, this is definitely someone, uh, something people are working on and uh, they are trying to, to find good light to work in the morning, work in noon and work in the evening. And, uh, but this is uh, something, yeah, I mean, those who are working, those institutions working on work safety and work protection, uh, they know about these uh, effects of light colors. That's definitely something, yes. There, there was one thing you mentioned about the vestibular Maybe we could do something about the vestibular sense. There was the US military, when they trained their drone, drone pilots, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they had a program whereby they were applying uh, an EMF stimulation to the brain. And the reasoning behind this was that um, normal people have a focus of attention mechanism that sort of causes you to focus in on the things that are important and you know remember those and learn those and there is a capability in people who are savants uh who just don't have that focus of attention mechanism and they bring all the data in and they can remember all the data for example uh you'll take someone who is like this and fly them in a helicopter over a city and they will remember all the details of the city, and then they can sit down afterwards and make this incredible, incredibly detailed drawing. And there was a scientist who thought, well, what if we were able to somehow disable this focus of attention mechanism in the brain temporarily to create this savant-like learning? And they were doing this on uh, military personnel who were learning to fly drones. And they found out that it worked rather well. And so what they would do is they would put something on their head that would focus electromagnetic energy onto certain centers of the brain and sort of temporarily disabling them. Now, I find that terrifying. Uh, in fact, uh, the doctor who did a lot of the research on this, uh, he was in a series of uh, like uh, science documentaries on like the Science Channel, for example. And um, so he was very much into this and he applied it to himself. And I noticed that over the years, he started developing tremors and so forth that you would see in these documentaries. Okay. And he, he never talked about it, but it's an interesting thing. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody tries to use it, maybe to uh, affect some of these issues, but um, it's uh, very frightening to me. It's, to me, I'm an electrical engineer. And to me, it's akin to microwaving your brain. Yeah, I mean, there are some companies that are developing brain computer interfaces and you can buy already some first stage products on the market, but you have to develop a lot of, a lot of software for yourselves and you can do already easy stuff with this. And, but most of it, it's, it's really an output. So you control something by the means of your brain. Right. Uh, that, that does exist, but... Uh, um, I'm absolutely sure that uh, research is much, much more forward compared to what you can already buy in uh, nowadays. I know from a few years ago, I don't think that these products are still on the market. You could buy yeah, vestibular stimulus uh, uh, systems uh, that were looking like an earphone. And they, they were, work? Uh, I think they di simply disabled uh, your, your vestibular organ to minimize uh, motion sickness. And that worked, I think. But through, um, through electromagnetic means? Yes. Wow. Yes. And uh, so, I mean, it can be help uh, for, for people as, as uh, flying drones or flying aeroplanes in a simulator or so. 
and uh, and you focus only on this organ. I mean, that's simple. It's it's not really a brain computer interface, but of course, uh, of course, uh, people are working on this, and there were solutions already on the market on this, and could be interesting. Could be a from my point of view, also for, for some virtual reality applications, absolutely useful just to, to minimize motion sickness for those people that are in particular sensitive to it. Hmm. Interesting. Cool, yeah, thank you so much. And I think uh, our time is approaching to the end. And uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Christoph, uh, to uh, you know, become our guest speaker and show us like such amazing uh, laboratory and how um, you measure how to measure you know um, all the device in a scientific way. So yeah, thank you so much, and uh, hopefully see you see you soon. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much for inviting us, Dominic, and yeah. uh, thank you, Jim, for for the nice discussion we had. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Then, yeah, so, and hopefully see everyone next time. Bye-bye. Mm, yeah, have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.